Okay, I have 6.30, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm convening this February 3rd meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Holly, would you call the roll, please? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Henry. Here. Director Ackman. Here. Director Fulce. Here. And Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Okay. Um, this is the section of the meeting where we have uh, time for oral communications from member of the public on topics that are not on the agenda but are within the purview of the district. I see we have uh, two attendees. Would either of you like to speak at this point? If you do, raise your hand. Okay. Seeing. Um, None. We'll go on to um, the president's report. And I just wanted to um, note that Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency held its first board of directors meeting uh, at last Wednesday, January 27th. At the meeting, the board elected a new board chair and vice chair. I was selected as chair and Chris Perry from Scotts Valley and past president was chosen as vice prayer chair. Um, topics that the board will be taking up in the next few monthly meetings include uh, staffing for planning and implementation of projects in the basin, financial contributions by various entities to run Santa Margarita, and prioritizing projects with the goal of submitting a proposal to the state by the end of the year for planning, feasibility studies, and perhaps implementation. So there's a lot going on. Um, so I'm planning on putting a report um, on the agenda um, to talk about Santa Margarita, what we're doing uh, sometime in March, so that Jamie and I can get board feedback on Santa Margarita activities and priorities. Okay, with that, I'll go on to the regular agenda. We don't have any unfinished business. Uh, in new business, the first item is onboarding procedures. Yes, uh, Chair, uh, the admin committee has been working on preparing uh, standardized onboarding procedures since uh, May of 2021. After several uh, revisions and review, the committee has agreed that the attached information is a comprehensive collection of documents, forms, and procedures uh, to make transitioning into a position of a board member or committee member uh, to be uh, better informed and understandable. Um, uh, that we're looking uh, for you to review this tonight, uh, add comments, or move the, that the board of directors adopt the procedures and documents by motion of the board. Okay. With that, I'll give it back to the chair. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Jamie, since you're the chair of that committee, would you like to comment? Sure. Um, first of all, I want to thank the staff um, because I, I know that this has been a little bit of a labor of love. Um, there's, you know, probably been more iterations of this than they care to recall. Um, I want to say that I think this was the first thing that we took up when I was first appointed to the board and appointed to the admin committee um, at my very first meeting. And so I'm really thrilled that now we're bringing it out of the admin committee and to the full board for adoption um, after my first committee meeting as chair. Um, it is, uh, I think, there is always going to be work um, that can be done to improve this document. And that was acknowledged uh, in the administrative committee meeting. I know um, Mark Dolson, even as we were looking at this iteration of it, had some really good suggestions for ways that we can even improve it in the future so that it's more accessible for future um, board members and new committee members. But we thought it was really important to sort of put a pin in it now so that Holly can start using this document to onboard our new committee members. Um, and uh, of course, you know, that way uh, we can revisit it uh, this summer. I think, Rick, we had decided that we would come back to it this summer to make those adjustments that uh, uh, committee member Dolson's uh, recommended. And uh, we look forward to continued improvement on this process. But I think we're really happy with where it is right now. And so we would love uh, a, a, to, I would like to make a motion to support um, the onboarding procedures. And I would love uh, to, 
answer any questions that anybody may have. Are you making a motion right now, Jamie, or? Yeah. I'm making a motion, yes. All right, is I'll there a second? I'll second. Okay. Um, so we will have some discussion of the motion. Um, Bob, did you wanna, since you're the other member of the committee? <clears throat> yes, um, I think Jamie summed it up uh, very well. I think we went through three iterations on it. Um, and I, I believe this is a pretty comprehensive set of information for uh, new members, committee and board um, to be able to get up to speed faster on um, the district and its operations. Okay. Uh, Lois, did you have a comment? I think this is a very good idea and I'm happy to see this. Mark? Um, yes, I have several uh, questions or comments on it. Uh, some of the items in here were a surprise to me. Um, I commend the admin committee for getting this completed. Um, as a new board member in uh, December 2020, this was something that I was looking for. And after I joined the board, asked or requested something like this be done. So good. Um, some questions that I have. In the onboarding procedures, I note that um, we're supposed to have business cards as board members? Really? Um, it's a little old school. <laughs> that, 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 <laughs> well, they're, 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 they're still in use. In right. The world. But, um, but, uh, I, I wasn't aware that I was supposed to get any business cards. I don't know. I question the need for that, but since the committee has passed on that. Um, also, um, the, the uh, aspect of tours of the district, um, I think that's a great idea, but the uh, ability to implement that, I think is difficult uh, because I've had this question come up uh, at least a couple of times during engineering committee meetings. So uh, I hope that the staff is able to support that aspect. Mark, can I just interrupt you? I noticed Holly has her hand up. Is there something you wanted to interject? Well, um, I just wanted to say that the uh, business cards and the tours, and there are several things that uh, the name plates, that's another thing where I have to uh, order name plates. This was right. all for when we did and when we're going to be meeting in person and going to events together where we are out in the public and you want to be identified or you want to be, um, you know, hand out your card, that sort of thing. Okay. That's not something that um, okay. Since you've basically been on the board that we've been doing anything about. So. I, okay, and maybe that's the perspective that I'm taking it from um, is the limited amount of public contact and other contact that I've had in the past year. So, okay. Um, I, I have a couple of other questions, but I see that Jamie has got a comment also. If it's quick, Jamie, or otherwise I'll let Mark finish. It's quick. I just wanted to add that some of those items I think are, are choices that new committee members or directors can make for themselves if they don't want the business cards and they don't use them, they can choose not to have them. But it's good to know they're available should they want them. Okay. Um, under practices and procedures, um, uh, I had a, for questions that I might have as a board member, uh, on consent agenda items. Are we routinely then uh, submitting those as questions to the staff um, based on something that I see on page 12? Is that the process that we're supposed to be following? Uh, Jamie, Bob? 
I, I'm happy to answer that, but I, I you know, my impression uh, is that that is the process that we're following now when we receive the, our okay. agendas and we have a question. Um, so I, maybe I'm not clear on, on um, what your question is. Okay, uh, during meetings, um, uh, board meetings, we often are asking uh, of some specific questions um, of staff as to what's in their uh, reports. Uh, if it's lengthy, yes, I have submitted uh, an email with uh, here are the four questions that I have about this agenda item, but it's, uh, but it's not a simple one off. I haven't been doing that. So you guys need to revert to that. I, th okay. I think what I would say on this is that th this particular item does echo what's in the board policy manual. And I, I think that it's a matter of judgment. Um, if it's just some sort of technical little thing, it's probably cool. better to uh, send in a, uh, a message to the pertinent staff member. Mm -hmm. But if it's kind of more of philosophical or maybe of interest to other people, I think it's perfectly okay to ask questions. So I think okay. that point is just trying to keep people from asking, you know, endless tech, techie questions that, um, most people won't be interested in. Right. Okay. And right. you had your hand up. Are you, were you referring to me? Yeah, Bob, I was calling on you because you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I was just basically going to say what you said, which is it's it's kind of just uh, courtesy protocol, you know, that kind of thing. And yes, use best judgment. Okay. All right. Rick, did you want to follow up on that? Just, you know, when you, and keep in mind when, if you do have a, a question, and you send it in to, to staff, we will respond to all, all directors. So you all get that answer. So it's not like you will just get the answer. And it's okay. the same, obviously it's to save time at the board meeting with consent as we try to move through consent pretty routinely. But from time to time, you know, you all will have a question, which is great. And, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a t lengthy question, send it to us and we will respond to all. Okay, all right. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, Rick answered it. Go All ahead. Right. Um, a nitpicky editorial comment on page 12, I see a reference to a general manager uh, versus a district manager. So I'm not, I don't know who the general manager is, which I assume you mean Rick. Um, and my last comment is on page 14, uh, the documents for review that are listed, um, I think it's unrealistic to expect committee members to review uh, the documents that we have listed there, in particular, the uh, LAFCO Service and Sphere of Influence Agreement, which is um, all of 354 pages in length, uh, given uh, pushback that we have heard at the engineering committee from uh, at times extremely lengthy uh, agenda packets for committee meetings. So no need to respond to that, simply a comment. Okay, that's all what I have to say. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, I guess I'll say my comments on it and um, I'll follow up mostly on what Mark just said right there, which was um, I, I found the list of what committee and board members are expected to read sort of off-puttingly long. It, it seems to me that the required readings before their first meeting should be trimmed to the relevant sections of the board policy manual and a reading on the Brown Act so that they understand, you know, how to behave. But beyond that, the readings should be optional or tailored to the subject matter um, of a good, given committee. I, I also think it's a, a good idea to to have the suggested readings highlight recent documents. Um, for example, it, it could even be profoundly misleading to have, you know, 10 year old grand jury reports that have been subsequently responded to and, you know, situations changed. So um, I think that would be good. Um, I, I like the um, checklist for the district secretary. I thought that was really useful. Um, my main comment is I think that the summary of practices and procedures should not be included. 
and instead the link to the board policy manual should be provided. And the reason is, is that I started to read those practices and procedures and it is not um, a summary of excerpts of board policy manual. Part of it is, um, and that's what I expected it to be, but when I started checking, it isn't. Instead, there's whole paragraphs that I'm not sure where they came from, but they aren't from the board policy manual. And in some cases, they're a bit crosswise with how the board policy manual tackles the same topic. So for example, uh, the discussion of strategic planning and budgets. Um, in other cases, there are paragraphs on subjects that are not even addressed in the board policy manual, which, for example, I would strongly agree with, disagree, disagree with. And for example, that the board should aim to have all decisions be unanimous. Um, I, I think that's unrealistic and isn't necessarily a high goal. Sometimes, you know, when Bob gives a principled no vote, that's a good thing and it should be recorded because it's uh, indicating a certain view that probably reflects what some of our ratepayers believe. Um, also, the next part of that, which said that if there isn't unanimity, a board member can ask that the item be referred back to committee, seems like uh, a recipe for obstructing things. Um, and it's just simply uh, not good governance. Boards have to make decisions and move on. And then there was one in there that I actually was surprised that Bob let get through <laughs> because it says uh, that board members have to support all board actions. And although I believe that board members are not allowed to actively obstruct, I think to say that they they have to support um, is overreach. In other words, if a you know a reporter phones you up and say, "Do you support this?" You should be able to say no, and and here's here's why. Um, so, uh, I, I think that the document should not be included with the welcome letters, rather the welcome letter should just have a link to the board policy manual. And finally, it's just a whimsical sort of thing. I think it would be a nice welcome gift for new board members to provide them with a copy um, of that interesting book that we all got on the history of the district. I, I found it really illuminating and a copy of uh, the $5 paperback on the revised Robert's Rules of Order in brief uh, so that people can uh, read that, you know, over breakfast sometime. But we do use Robert's Rules of Order. And if you haven't been on a, a, an organization that uses them, it's, a, it's worth checking, checking those out. Um, I don't know if uh, Bob or Jamie, you want to respond to my comments. If you do, fine. If not, we'll just go out to uh, members of the public. Um, oh, Bob got his hand up. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I was just going to say that I, <clears throat> you know, I think that there are uh, points uh, well taken on is particularly the disalignment between some of the language and the board policy manual. And um, I would consider a friendly amendment to the motion that would um, ask the staff to uh, adjust the text of this to instead replace um, the uh, descriptions with a link to the board policy manual rather than the summary. Um, but Bob, I... Yeah, that, that, that's fine. Okay. So basically we're just saying to uh, ad adopt this um, with the friendly amendment being uh, that we um, replace the um, practices and what's it called? Practices and procedures uh, with a link to the board policy manual in the welcome letters. Is that right? Yes, but I would also like to suggest a friendly amendment because um, I actually think it is a little draconian to say the board commit and committee members should at a minimum. And so perhaps under number 11 documents for review, we say board and committee members may review the following documents. And then of course, these are all just documents that are available to them should they so choose. Yeah, I think that's sounds a little more friendly. I, you know, certainly if I'd seen that list as it's written, when I was thinking of joining the engineering committee, I would have gone, oh my goodness, no way. I'm not going to read the audit reports. <laughs> you know, that's, um, so, uh, okay. All right. So Holly, are you managing to track this? Oh, you're muted. 
I apologize. Um, yeah, so I'm not quite sure. So do you want me to do away with the entire um, practices and procedures portion? Just take that out of the... Right. Um, okay. So it would, not, it would not be attached. It, and instead in the welcome letters, you'll just simply say, um, you'll make a reference to the uh, board policy manual and give them a link. And you might want to maybe change the sentence to say, you know sort of point them to the relevant, the most important sections. Like they, you know, they don't have to read about reimbursements and all that sort of stuff. Right. But, but I, you know, you're you're a good writer. I think we can trust you to <laughs> to to do that. Is that don't you think, Thank Jane? You. Um, I, I think that, that that makes sense. Um, and yeah, I support Gail's suggestion. Okay. All right. Um, so let's go out to the members of the public. Um, I know uh, Mark Dolson was is a member of that committee. Did did you want to add anything, Mark? You don't have your hand up, but I'll give you first 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 right of refusal. No? Okay, then we'll go to Larry Ford. So CTV folk, can you allow Larry to speak? Um, where are Here we our, go. Here we go. Well, there he is. Yeah. Wow. He's suddenly Sorry. become a panelist. That's weird. Okay, go ahead, Larry. <laughs> okay, thank you. This is Larry Ford from Felton. I wanted to uh, just ask, shouldn't there be some mention of the Bagley-Keene Act? I see reference to the Brown Act, but I think the the Bagley-Keene Act is maybe, you know, more recent related to the Brown Act, open meeting issues. Gina, you want to comment on that? Yeah, the, the Brown Act is most applicable to local agencies, whereas Bagley Keene is more applicable to the state. Oh, oh, okay, got but it. But they they got cover it. very similar territory, so the uh, the <clears throat> that's understandable. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other comments from our attendees? If not, um, I'll come back to the board. We, we have a motion on the table, but I'll give you another opportunity to comment or ask a question if you'd like. Um, if not, okay, Holly, go ahead and um, call the roll call vote. President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Fulce. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay. Um, as amended, uh, it is adopted unanimously. Yay! This is a little bit a long time coming. So congratulations to all of you for working hard and getting this out. This is really good. All right. Our next uh, item of business is the Alta V Project Award of Construction Bid. Yes, uh, Chair and the District Engineer is here tonight to present this item to the board. Okay. Go ahead, Josh. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this item is award of the construction contract for replacement of undersized and fire damaged mains on Altavia Drive, Prospect Avenue, and Monon Way in Brookdale. We received six proposals on this project, ranging in price from 2.1 million to 3.8 million, quite a spread. The low bid came from Anderson Pacific Engineering Company, who has done a fair bit of work for us in the past. It was a responsive bid, and it came in at $2,107,470. I have in the memo provided a recommended uh, motion for the board, and I will cheerfully take questions on this. Okay, um, Mark? As chair of that committee, you want to make any comments? Um, I reviewed the bid from Anderson Pacific also and uh, found it to be satisfactory. Um, 
And I want to point out that five of the six bids are within 15% of each other from high to low. Um, from my perspective, that says a good bid package was put out. So good drawings, good specifications, so that all bidders uh, could uh, were seeing similar and didn't have a lot of questions or qualms uh, about what was in there. So uh, I agree with the recommendation to award to Anderson Pacific. Okay. Bob, would you like to comment? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, having that number of bids is, is really good. And I think that reflects um, a lot of hard work on the part of our, our staff and our district engineer in particular. And so thank you for doing that. Um, I did have a request, and that is as we continue to um, do these uh, contracts, it would be uh, helpful to get a summary of where we are on drawing down the funds out of our two loans. Um, I, I know we still have money in them, but I'd, I'd like to kind of have periodically where we are with, with the amounts that we still have left in those loans. That seems like a good idea, Bob. How uh, how would we, Rick, you want to say how you would implement that? Would that be something Kendra would do or should Josh do it or? Yeah, no, I think that, you know, the finance manager, I'll work with her on, on we can get that in her, her monthly report. Um, or quarterly, or quarterly, Rick, it doesn't have to be. Okay, quarterly, uh, quarterly. I, 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 didn't, I wasn't sure if you wanted it sooner, but yeah, we can, we can get that in the quarterly report. Um, and uh, I'll work with uh, Kendra on that. That's much much more suited for uh, for Kendra than Josh. And um, we may be able to run it quickly through the uh, finance committee as well to, uh, on the reporting format. Thank you. That would be really great. Okay. Keep us up to date. Uh, Jamie. Um. I, I don't have a specific question. I think probably in the next item, some of my questions will be answered, but I'm, I'm just sort of understanding the, the you know, phasing of this project. So this, this contract award would be purely for um, the design phase of this work. Um, you know, we're gonna, in our next item, um, entertain a contract award for the construction management. And then we would be coming back um, following the design phase and a subsequent RFP process for the actual construction, um, just clarifying, no. No, no not, not exactly. This, excuse me, um, I'll just jump in here. This contract is for the actual construction. In this particular instance, we did the design in-house, so there never was a design RFP. The next item on the budget is for construction management wherein we contract for day-to-day -day oversight and administration of the construction. Does that clarify? Or? I, yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I guess what I was not understanding was, um, the, you know, when I was, because I don't understand engineering documents in the way that Mark does, when I was reading the RFP, under bids received, it says the district received six proposals for the design phase of this project tabulated below in ascending order, right? So I'm looking at that through the lens of and this being a contract for design work. And if that was, confusion. that was my error for which I apologize. What okay. I should have read was six proposals for the construction phase of this project. Got it. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Of course, I apologize for the error. Um, Lois? I have no comment. Uh, neither, uh, Rick, go ahead. You're muted, Rick. I just wanted to say after the board made their comments that the, this Alta V of pipeline um, is pipeline that runs parallel to Highway 9 um, from Brookdale almost into Bolt. Up on uh, up on the uh, Ben Lowen Mountain, it was heavily damaged uh, by the CZU fire. This pipeline was above ground, uh, crisscrossing across the mountain. Um, it's been uh, subject to uh, disasters in the past, but never as heavily as um, CZU fire. 
So this will be a complete replacement relocation from the mountainside down into the roadway. Um, and this is a, a project that the district um, uh, is uh, really looking forward to get completed because we, we do spend a lot of staff time up on that mountain repairing the above ground line and it's been uh, very problematic over the years. This is part of the original citizens utility system. So this is a, a great project all the way around for the district. Okay. Um, I don't have any uh, questions or comments. So let's go out uh, to members of the public and see if any of them have any questions or comments. I don't see any. So coming back, uh, Josh has provided us with a motion, which I'll go ahead and read, um, that we move to direct the district manager to enter into a contract with Anderson Pacific Engineering Construction Inc. for construction of the Altavia Pipeline Replacement Project in the amount of $2,107,470. Um, is there any more discussion of this, the motion? All right, if not, um, Holly, let's go ahead and uh, have the roll call vote. President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Henry? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. And Director Smalley? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Um, we now move on to the next item of new business, which is for the uh, contract for the construction management phase of this same project. Chair, did we have public comment on that last item? We did. did we? I'm sorry. We did. Okay. We didn't have uh, any comments, but I went out to them. <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, yes, and uh, the district engineer is here to present uh, the uh, construction management uh, for Altavia to the board. Josh. Thank you, Rick. This is for the same project, the Altavia pipeline replacement. This is for construction management. And uh, just a side note, I used the same template on this as the previous memo and made the same error. This is not for the design phase. This is for construction management in the construction phase. We received three bids. Uh, as with the construction, these bids were fairly close. They range from a low of $192,185 to a high of $240,744. All three companies provided very solid bids. I would cheerfully have recommended any of them. And as a result, have recommended that we award to Sandus with a low bid. And I have provided a suggested motion to the board and we'll take questions. Okay, Mark, you wanna start out? Sure. Um, Santa says a little bit, um, their proposal that they submitted was satisfactory. Um, we've worked with them on a number of projects in the past. Um, Josh, I do have a question. Um, on page 53, uh, they submitted um, plan review comments. Um, and I note that this is the second time that they've done this in their proposals. Um, do these uh, comments have any validity? Uh, are they worthwhile? Or are they just commenting to comment? I believe they are simply pointing out to us that they have done a thorough review of the plans. Mm -hmm. by pointing out some fairly minor comments. Okay. 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 I, I will comment that I have noticed on Sandus's proposals recently, they mm -hmm. have taken to going a little bit above and beyond the RFP to really make it clear to us that they are reading everything available and that they are making an effort a strong effort to address all of our concerns a little bit in advance. And I commend them for that mm -hmm. and hope that they continue to provide uh, RFP responses of this quality. Okay. That's all my comments. Thanks. 
Bob? Yes, um, I'm assuming that construction management costs are also calculated in the FEMA reimbursement rec. Is that is that correct? That, so, that is correct. So, so in addition to the 75% on the construction, we'll also get 75% on the construction management. That's correct. And also that we will be reimbursed uh, uh, staff time on plan preparation as well. So this is a complete FEMA funded project. Excellent. Is there any other state money available for, um, for this as well? You know, I don't, I don't believe so. Um, I, I don't believe so, uh, Bob. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Lois, did you have any questions or comments? Well, I am aware that Santos has done a lot of work for us and they've done a good job. And I go along with the recommendation that we go with Santos. Okay. <laughs> Jamie? No comments. Okay. I don't have any either. So let's go out to uh, members of the public. Are there any questions or comments by members of the public? Seeing none, I'll come back to the board um, and ask for one more round of questions or comments. Seeing none, Holly, can you take a roll call vote? Oh, oh wait, did I didn't I didn't make a motion yet, have we? Please. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Let me read. Let me read the motion that Josh provided for us. Um, move to direct the district manager to enter into a contract with Sandus Civil Engineers Surveyors Planners for construction management of the Alta Via Pipeline Replacement Project in the amount of one hundred ninety-two thousand one eighty-five. I'll second that. Okay. Holly, would you now take the roll call vote? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Fultz. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, all right. The next order of business is the district's policy for conducting Prop 218 um, proceedings. Um, this was an item that Bob Fultz asked to put on the agenda. So it doesn't come with any uh, staff recommendations. So we'll let uh, Bob go ahead and uh, introduce or discuss it initially. Yeah, and, and hopefully the um, cover memo on it was um, helpful. But to summarize for folks that may not have had a chance to read it in the, uh, in the public, um, during the last Prop 218 process, I received feedback from a number of folks, and we did during the meeting as well, that it might have been helpful to have a hearing to answer questions to allow people to decide what to do on their vote, whether they wanted to protest it or not, and then have a subsequent hearing um, where we actually took um, final action. So, um, the attachment, which is a modification of the current policy, uh, was intended as a starting point for either the board or committee if we decided that we wanted to uh, take this up in preparation for uh, our next Proposition 218, which uh, will be coming up at, at some point here uh, soon, I'm sure, as a way to uh, improve our transparency and our uh, communications with uh, the public on something that's of vital importance to them. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody may have about my proposal. Okay. Um, let's let uh, staff talk about it first. Um, Gina, since this is sort of a legal related thing, do you want to make a comment? Sure, I, I'm happy to, to do that. Um, I do have concerns about making these types of changes to the Prop 218 policies and procedures. And the main reason for that is that the district's 218 policies and procedures, as they currently exist, are, are written as sort of a roadmap 
or a tool to help the staff jump through the very technical wickets that Prop 218 sets and thereby mitigate the very significant risks that go with a Prop 218 process. I have concerns that adding or, or changing things in ways that deviate from the requirements of 218 could actually confuse the process and potentially even confuse exactly what legal standard applies to the district's action and thereby create some, some additional risk. Um, I, I do think that each Prop 218 process is unique and there is a fairly long process of conducting a rate study, bringing it to the board, getting approval, bringing the notice to the board, getting approval for that and coming, usually there, there's often public workshops and then ultimately a hearing. And each process can be a little bit different and the board has lots of opportunities, you know, to weigh in on, on how it should unfold. And I, um, I, I would not recommend um, baking these kinds of things into the policies and procedures and thereby kind of creating this uh, disconnect between the, the actual legal requirements of 218 and the district's policies. Uh, Rick, did you want to say anything? Well, you know, I, I make sure I'm not muted. You know, I, I read through it and then I, I also went back and, and, and looked at our minutes uh, from our last um, public hearing, which was a, a virtual public hearing. Um, but, you know, I didn't hear those type of complaints. You know, there was 41 um, uh, in attendance at that meeting. Uh, 16 were in favor, three uh, uh, stated they were not in favor of the rate increase. Um, I, I didn't hear complaints on the process uh, and I didn't see that in the in the minutes. You know, I, I do know that staff on the CZU spent an incredible amount of time on outreach. And I, I think that the outreach that we performed on the CZU was much better than previous uh, 218s. I mean, we had a media day, we had, you know, um, TV news, we had print news, Sentinel, Press Pranner. It was on TV, it was on radio, multiple interviews. Our website had a considerable amount of information. I think our outreach was, I, I would consider it to be, you know, almost outstanding the amount of outreach. And I have people tell me they see me on TV every day and they can't pick up a newspaper without something from the district. We we had a, I thought we had a fabulous response from uh, the news media, maybe because it, the CZU fire was dramatic. You know, and I have been involved in several of these Prop 218s um, with the district. And the last, you know, our big rate increase public hearing turned into a, a free-for-all. We had an assault. Uh, we had uh, directors intimidated. Um, I, I don't know if we want to do that twice um, for one rate, rate increase. The sheriff was called at the last uh, 218 that we had in person. Um, you know, I, I didn't get any complaints that people, you know, weren't that informed. Um, so I, you know, I, I like our process. It's it's an easy to follow. Um, it's not it's not too complicated, I don't think. And you know, I'm comfortable with our current process. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to comment on this, and and I have two main points. Um, Gina sort of addressed the first one, which is I just think in general policy, um, it, it's it's not a good idea to make your own procedures different or more strict than what the statute requires. That just tends to create situations where it can bite you down uh, down the road. And, and I appreciate that Bob has said that, you know, that these, the, the law provides a floor, um, you know, not a ceiling to what we can do. But I, I would argue that, uh, you know, I appreciate that, but, you know, we can, we have the flexibility to change procedures slightly in response to whatever happens. And, you know, the few comments we got about people feeling like they didn't have enough time um, were basically, um, we could have addressed that by simply taking a recess um, and waiting and allowing people to send in email um, the, 
that they want to uh, send in a protest. So I don't think we need to really have specific rules to codify sensible behavior. Um, the second is, is I just don't see the evidence that, that there's really a need for change to procedures. And Bob's cover memo said that the common refrain from our community members attending the meeting was that they were dissatisfied with the process in some way. But in fact, when I looked at the minutes, the most common refrain was support for the surcharge, followed by people that opposed it. And obviously they had enough information to make that decision. And it really was only a few people who felt that they didn't have uh, sufficient um, information. So I, I think that, um, you know, if we had had a lot of people that were unhappy in this regard, they would have filed protests or we would have seen agitation after the fact by disgruntled ratepayers in the press or on social media. And as far as I know, I, I'm, I'm not aware of that happening. Um, the other is we received only 547 protests out of the 3,866 that would have been required to stop implementation of the surcharge. And you know, also this was despite the fact that kind of Bob did his own um, extensive outreach uh, in opposition to the surcharge. So if this had been a close vote, I, I, I might've been more susceptible to think that the idea that we need to have different procedures in place, but this wasn't a close vote. And I didn't see a significant public out cry afterwards. So I, I, for that reason, I, I favor uh, taking no action on Bob's suggestion. Jamie, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I, um, I share your concerns, um, Chair, uh, and I, I would also favor taking no action. But I, I wanted to ask, in the context of the, you know, idea that, that the, the 218 uh, legislation is the the floor, not the ceiling. Like we can, as a board, without codifying into our um, policy, direct staff to take certain actions in the context of exploring rate changes in the same way that we have already done with the rate study that we plan to to do later this year. So we don't have to make a change to our policy if we, as a board, decide you know, we want to do extensive outreach on a particular topic. Is, isn't that right, Rick and Gina? I'll let Gina go first because she's legal. <laughs> and uh, then I'll go after. Yes, I think it, the district always brings a um, final rate study and a Prop 218, draft Prop 218 notice to the board for approval. And that's well into the process. But at, at that point, there is an opportunity for the board to say, you know, I want to see two workshops or um, of FAQ on the district's website and, and so on. And I think we got some of that type of direction this past time around. And, and if, the, if the district really wants to inform and, you know, see the rate increase through we we have to do that type of outreach because if we don't we will get the protest votes if we don't inform our customer base of what their money is going to be used for and i think we did a fantastic job uh with czu and you know we incorporated a lot of the board's thinking uh on having separate funds and so forth uh, to make sure that we showed our, our ratepayers where that money was going and how we'd manage it I think you know we would do that again. That's just uh, common sense if we want to get a rate increase passed uh, without protest. And I completely agree with you, Rick. I think that you did a fabulous job of outreach and communication around the CZU um, uh, surcharge. But I, I, you know, the, I guess what I was saying is that you know because we as a board can can make de decisions along the way as to what we want the outreach process for any particular 218 process to look like, um, I, I don't see the particular need to codify it into a policy. I think that we can appre approach each process and, and make those determinations as, you know, as we um, feel are appropriate um, and are reflective of the community's concerns. And, and, you know, again, here I have to agree with 
Chairman Hood, when I, you know, when I say that my recollection of the CZU um, surcharge hearing was that the, the majority of the comments were in support of implementation of a surcharge, and um, and that the you know amount of opposition to it was what I would consider fairly fairly de minimis for for something like this. So um, I don't see the, the need in this particular. Uh, in um, Lois? Well, I was at that uh, 2017 uh, meeting uh, about the five-year rate increase, and it did get totally out of hand. However, I think the biggest complaint people have about the 218 process is there's really no way to get enough no votes ever to stop the process. And I, I've heard that complaint and complaint that it's set up so that the ones who want the increase, um, uh, they, they get it because there are not enough people who are gonna vote no. And a lot of people don't understand um, the process. And I think that's the biggest complaint. I don't think there's really been complaints about uh, information going to people in the district. Uh, I, I really don't. I think it's just the whole process that bothers a lot of people. That's pretty much all I and say about it. Okay, uh, Mark? Yes, um, my recollection without going back and looking at uh, the minutes of meetings was similar to the numbers that Rick just expressed, a significant number in support of the, of the surcharge, a limited number, either one opposing it or a much smaller number commenting on the uh, time frame of the hearing and the overall process. So based on that and the fact that I thought between the district's messaging and what I read in media reports, that there was sufficient information out there that if you were a, uh, a member of the public that, that read anything, you knew that this was coming and you knew that this was out there. Um, so I didn't see the need that we needed to uh, amend that process. So I, I'm like Rick, I, I'm comfortable with what we have um, in this process at this point. Um, Bob, I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond. Would you like to do it now or after I go out um, to the public? Uh, you can go to the public, sure. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, you, you can go to the public first, okay. yes. Um, are there any comments by members of the public? Okay, I don't see any, so um, I'll come back to you, Bob, if you want to um, say anything in response just, to people's comments. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I would echo what, what Lois said. I think Lois is absolutely right on. And, and part of the motivation I had was trying to address that as well. Um, I know that there are questions that are asked in the community that are not necessarily part of any FAQ that we put out, which being able to collect those additional questions and get those out into the community before voting close, I think would be very helpful. Um, However, given the comments I've, I've heard, I'm looking forward to a very robust conversation about process when the next Prop 218 uh, comes before the board. I, I think it would be very helpful for us to uh, take some of the things that have been expressed here tonight um, uh, to heart as we go through that next process. So thank you all. Okay, um, thank you, Bob. Um, is somebody going to make a motion? There is no need. 
Okay. I All right. So I, well, I think this has been a good discussion and I think what we, I certainly felt like we need to, especially in light of the weirdnesses of doing things uh, remotely and through hybrid sessions, we, we really need to give this some thought next time so that um, everybody feels really comfortable with, with what we do. Um, yeah, Jamie. Um, I, I appreciate that. And I, I did just want to say in, you know, in a, a defense of the process that while, you know, it may have been imperfect, I think, um, you know, as a board member, I feel very comfortable that there was general consensus um, and support for the surcharge and um, that, that uh, the, the process as, as perfect or imperfect as it may have been was also informed by COVID, the pandemic. The nature of trying to do this work under you know short staffed conditions and and you know having to you know we were doing lots of emergency board meetings and special board meetings during that time and so I just want to kind of remember that that was you know there were huge impacts to staff um, that that you know we were trying to navigate as we were um, moving through that process and um, and so. You know, maybe maybe this wasn't the most perfect version of the 218, and 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 we can put more time and energy into outreach in the future. But this was a unique circumstance. Okay, I I would agree with that, Mark. Yes, um, I do want to express to Bob. I appreciate the fact that you uh, spent the time to put together a thoughtful memo on this about something that you are very concerned about. Um, and I do also agree with your last comment that you look forward to the robust discussion of this uh, the next time we have a, uh, a 218 process. And, and I agree. I think we should be having that kind of a discussion about these things. Um, I think that's part of our uh, duty as board members to have that kind of a discussion. So thanks. Okay. Lois? Well, I've been through a number of 218 processes and I have never seen one fail to pass. The only things, when you have a really small number of people voting, then you have a good chance of the Prop 18 failing. But since it's a no vote, instead of a yes vote, it, it's virtually impossible to, to defeat it. I, I just haven't seen that happen. Okay, um, I think we should move on to the consent agenda. Um, and are there any items that uh, members of the board would like to take off the consent agenda? How about members of the public? No, all right. Uh, what about district reports? Any questions or comments? Uh, Mark, you had your hand up first. Oh, okay. I thought Bob did, but. Oh, I'll okay. Go. I don't care, whichever. <laughs> Bob, you want to go ahead? Um, go ahead, Mark. <laughs> oh, sure, that's fine. Okay. We're trying to be too gracious to each other and falling over ourselves and doing it well. Uh, on the uh, engineering department report, uh, Josh, do you have a feel for when the uh, Quail Hollow pipeline work starts? All we've seen in the last, uh, I think, three summaries from you is uh, the 120 day delay due to materials. Yeah, the 120 day delay. I'm regularly reaching out to the folks at Granite Rock and mm -hmm. pushing them to push their suppliers. Best guess right now, late March. Okay. And, and that that has changed a couple of times, but that's pretty close to the original 120 day mark. Okay, because I was I was gonna ask, so when did we award that? But okay, if if March winds up with that, uh, so that it was four months before that, then okay. Late March early April is right in there. I think it was actually awarded the first meeting in this second meeting, no, December, I think, 
I would okay. I would have to look okay. it up to say for sure. Okay, you're you're in touch with them, and yes, it's close to that 120 days. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, the other questions, uh, two questions that I have are on the uh, finance report. Um, on page <clears throat> 111 of the document, uh, we note that the um, online bills, the e-bills, and the auto pay are all trending downwards over the last uh, 10 months or so. Uh, what's the reasoning for that? So prior to um, August 20, or so in July and previous to that, um, we didn't really have a way to filter out um, closed accounts. So the numbers from July prior to that included uh, people that had closed out their accounts, but still had kept their online account open. Uh -huh. um, so as of August, we were able to, um, with the new portal and all that, we were able to only filter out active accounts. So that this is giving a more accurate representation of our you know, actual online accounts. So starting in August and moving up, you will see that they are trending upwards. Um, it was just in Jul from July to August, it did have that uh, initial decrease because we were no longer okay. both active and closed accounts. Okay. Check yeah. out footnote three, Mark. <laughs> footnote uh, three that explains it. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, well, I apologize for not reading that detail to it. Okay. Thank you. Um, and lastly, on page 117, the arrearages. Um, why did we request the uh, 29950 that we have to refund? What's the explanation behind that? Yeah, so um, when we initially applied for the program in October, mm -hmm. uh, the total amount uh, was 170000 or so dollars in arrearages. Um, so with, from October to January, when we actually got the money, um, about $29,000 were paid uh, by customers on those delinquent accounts. And per the state's guidelines that we have to refund any of the monies that weren't applied yeah. to the accounts. Okay. During okay. Yeah. I, I understand customers pay the bills. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Bob? Yes, and uh, first one actually was a follow-up for, for Josh because I had a similar question. But um, is there any way for Granite to change their number if enough time goes by? They have stated, at least in an, in an email, that they will not increase their price, even if their prices go up, their costs go up. Okay. That was well, part that's... of the initial discussion when they told me about how long the delay was going to be. Okay. Well, that that's good. <laughs> it's a key concern, of course, given their bid. Um, okay, great, thank you. Um, environmental status report. Uh, Carly, thank you for putting in the grant information. It, would it be possible to organize them by year and or provide a summary number for each fiscal year? Sure, that's no problem. We can update that the next time around. I appreciate that, thank you. Um, but um, we are definitely making some really good progress and what's in the pipeline, assuming we get even a fraction of it is phenomenal. And so great work to everybody that's working on grants. Thank you. It's getting close to be updated and you'll see some substantial upgrades uh, for grant applications as well as we move through the next month or two. I, I, I think my target was like a 20 to one ROI and it looks like you're gonna blow by that pretty yeah. easily. So that's really good. Um, the next one was on finance report on page 110. We have this um, a summary document here, which has operating revenue expenses and income. 
would it be possible to break out the CZU surcharge from the operating revenue? I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that this table, given that it might be the only thing looked at, is maybe not giving a clear picture of where we are relative to our real operating revenue, which should exclude the CZU surcharge since that's not able to be used for general operating expenses. Uh, yeah, so I I did break it out in like the summary wording, but I can also um, break it out in the graph as well or the I, table. I, I think that would be that would be helpful. Tables are Agreed. tables are better than words sometimes for board folks. Yeah, I'll I'll update that on the next one. Great, thank you. <laughs> on the um, past due accounts, uh, yeah, I saw that we kind of didn't go in the right direction. Um, are all the tenant accounts closed off and were those balances transferred to the owners? Is that what I'm reading here? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Unless they were paid off, of course. Right. Okay, great. Um, I think that was all on the reports. I did have one other comment, but it's the last item on the agenda that I wanted to comment on. Okay. So we can get to that later. Let, let's finish with reports first and then you can go ahead and... Uh, Jamie? Yes, yeah, thanks. On, on the subject of past due accounts, um, I, I just wanted to, and, and, and grants, um, uh, I know we were at some point in February going to be receiving um, grant funding um, to for the, uh, you know, utility offset. Um, this, this would be, you know, for people who needed relief uh, uh, due to the pandemic uh, conditions and, and we, re we received a tranche of funding that we were going to be applying to uh, past due utility bills. Um, I'm just wondering, I know we had talked about uh, in the admin committee meeting that, that the district was going to do some kind of a communication to start kind of explaining to the customer, you know, what, what that process looked like if they were... Um, uh, you know, in arrears and and eligible for um, that relief funding. Um, so I'm just checking in about that uh, and and you know reminding you that we would love to see some outreach uh, to customers who may be eligible for that. Yeah. So uh, we already did receive all that funding. Um, that was what was applied for in October, and we received the funding um, in January of this year. And uh, letters were sent out to the individual customers um, that received credits on their accounts. And, and uh, that was, they noted the amount of the credit and then also that they could uh, call into the office to make an arrangement on the remaining balance. Um, at this time, that's the only funding for the water arrearages that the state uh, is providing to us. Uh, there will be another go around for the wastewater arrearages that we're going to apply for. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as they're not offering any other uh, water arrearages uh, in the future. Um, I understand. What I'm asking though is that there be some, that whatever the letter was that we made available to customers who are eligible. If, if you could share that letter um, publicly or with, um, uh, you know, some of the nonprofits who are working um, on uh, rental and utility stabilization during the pandemic, they're getting phone calls from people who are um, behind on there and they're not understanding the process. They're thinking that they're going to get money um, coming through the state. So it, it would be really helpful for water districts um, that have received funding and communicated that out to those eligible customers to share that so that you know other nonprofits that are working on this sort of have information to just tell people like, okay, this has already happened and you may be eligible, you know, in a subsequent round of funding if you meet these conditions. Um, I'm just uh, I'm putting that out there as a request to staff if there's some kind of a communication that we could share more publicly um, just to explain that process for those people who did who were uh, eligible to receive that, I think that would be helpful to other people who are confused about it and still trying to get information. Got it. I understand. Yeah, we will, we can work on that. Thank you. Okay. Any more comments or questions on things related to district reports? Um, if not, Bob, you said you had something you wanted to comment with regard to written communications. 
Yes, um, the the last item 9.1, this email we received from uh, Christina Wise. Um, I, I was a little concerned about it because it does address uh, the firm that we use for our public communications. Has this been addressed? Are we all are we all good in this now? Uh, yes, this has been addressed in both uh, Christina uh, and the Sentinel. Uh, Hannah Hagerman uh, has been um, contacted. Uh, there's been apologies given, um, and it has been um, addressed. Uh, and we will be addressing outreach uh, in general uh, with the admin committee, and, and it should be on the agenda for uh, the first meeting or for the meeting in February coming coming up. And, and so will Christina be accepting press releases from Marcy's team then in the future? You know, I, I can't answer on that question directly, Bob, but I do know that they've talked and they've come to an understanding okay. and both Christina mm -hmm. and uh, Hannah are satisfied but I don't know the extent of what that conversation was. Okay. It appears that, and, and I don't know, Carly, um, I know you were um, in the middle of that. Do you have anything to add on that? No, other than the apologies have been sent um, to both the Sentinel and the press banner, um, and also the, the press release um, in question was retracted. And at the admin committee coming up next week, we'll go into a little more detail. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for, for covering that. It was unfortunate. Yes. Jamie, as chair of that committee, did you want to say anything? Um, I, I just wanted to, you know, echo what, what Rick said, um, that, that, you know, our, our immediate step, um, I reached out to Rick after uh, we received the email from Christina alerting us to the issue. Um, and, you know, I think the apology... Uh, Everything has been handled appropriately, and I think that we need to have a thoughtful discussion at the administration, uh, at the administrative committee, in terms of just you know what does uh, the district really need in terms of PR going forward, and and is um, are our needs being met currently? Um, you know, uh, you know what what is what other um, opportunities may there be? So I, I think that this is you know really good reason to revisit that conversation at the administrative committee and uh, we hope to come back and and um you know have have a recommendation for the board if we decide that we need to make a change there and and at the request of uh the chair of the admin committee staff will be bringing a complete review of our outreach program uh to the committee for review uh next week or uh following week whenever that committee meeting meets Gina? Chair Mayhood, I just a, a legal caution here. This is it st could start to delve into the discussion that's going to be before the admin committee. I would suggest oh, yeah. uh, okay. wrapping it up. Okay. Um, so, and Mark, okay, you've taken your hand down. If there's something, Bob, it's essential that you say right now. Well, I, I'm I'm really pleased with the fact that we are going to be talking about this in the admin committee meeting. It's been a topic um, that that has been missing from the admin committee for uh, two years now, I think. So this is really good news. Okay. All right. Lois? I hate to say this, but I haven't a clue what you're talking about. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to follow Gina's um, advice and not pursue this anymore. Lois, you can read the... Uh, letter that was the email to the board which you should have already received from Christina Wise to inform you about what it I, I don't remember ever getting anything from Christina Wise. Christina? Uh, I was just going to chime in one last time Chair Mayhood and, and ask if um or suggest that the public be given an opportunity to comment on the district reports and the oh, I'm information. Sorry. I, yes you're right I failed to do that. Um, are there any comments um, on district reports? Seeing none, okay. Um, then we will, uh, next item is adjournment. So if there's no objections, I will um, declare this meeting adjourned. Good night all. Thank you, good night everyone. Thanks.